Why people play games the way they do, especially online, is something I think about quite a lot. But I don't always translate that interest over to video because I'm just not well versed on that type of subject. I am not a psychologist nor even a student. I'm just a guy who plays a lot of video games and watches a lot of other people play video games and I just base my thoughts on that. So far the only video I've ever made that comes close to the topic is compulsive gaming, which I'll leave a link to in the description in case you're interested. Recently though, I've been wondering a lot about multiple parts of the online aspect. I have experience with playing a few genres online, shooters, fighting games, and MMOs primarily. Not just player versus player, but cooperative play too. In fact, I generally say I prefer co-op more. And there's one common factor among a lot of these games that tends to become a regular hot topic specifically thanks to the Call of Duty community and its implementation within that franchise. Matchmaking. If you spend any amount of time talking about video games online, then you've undoubtedly run into one of the many yearly or even seasonal outrages about Call of Duty's skill-based matchmaking specifically. For anyone who might not be in the know, I'll give a quick explanation and history lesson on the idea. The concept of skill-based matchmaking has origins that go far past video games. You could easily go all the way back to the ELO rating system developed by chess master Arpad ELO decades ago. It's a measurement of player skill in the game of either chess or any other zero-sum game, where the difference in skill ratings between two players serves as a predictor of the outcome of their match. For example, Two players with an equal rating are expected to score an equal number of wins. But if one player has a higher rating, they're expected to win a greater percentage of their matches against the player with a lower rating. Makes sense. This methodology has been adopted by video game developers for numerous genres, and some even come up with their own formulas to consider all the important statistics of their own game. Halo 2 launched with Microsoft's True Skill system back in 2004, which records not only your performance in any given match, but how consistent that performance is, and also, this is the important factor, an uncertainty value which is dictated by that consistency. So if a player is good but plays frequently, their uncertainty value will be low and wins will count for slightly less because it's expected of them. But if they're good and play rarely, their uncertainty value is high, so wins will count for more, because wins are less expected. But it also means losses count for more too, so it's a double-edged sword. Since then, skill-based matchmaking has been a thing in video games across many competitive genres. Shooters, fighting games, MOBAs, you name it. And they all work in varying ways. I'll be the first to acknowledge that I am a little biased here because even though I mentioned earlier that I do play shooters online, I'm more engaged by fighting games, which is a genre where skill-based matchmaking has to be the way to do things, or the entire competitive experience will mean nothing and fall apart. But the thing that finally got me to pull the trigger on deciding to talk about it in a video is the 25-page document released straight from Activision Blizzard about how skill-based matchmaking actually does benefit the player base at large, which was released back in July, and it's been on my mind periodically since then. To sum up the entire paper, Activision Blizzard quietly turned skill-based matchmaking off and tracked how it gradually affected the player base. The results are exactly what the people who support skill-based matchmaking said they would be. A negative feedback loop where, slowly but surely, the top 10% of players would mercilessly stomp out and demoralize the bottom 90%, to the point where they just stopped playing. More players were quitting matches at a higher rate than they were while skill-based matchmaking was turned on. Basically, player retention went down for everyone except the best of the best. And if skill-based matchmaking were to stay off for everyone indefinitely, Chances are, it would probably take only a few months before the bottom 90% abandoned the game completely, and the top 10% would end up in a predicament of natural skill-based matchmaking because they're just the only ones left. Which would further result in them slowly abandoning the game too, because every single match is now a guaranteed sweatfest, which they also don't like. 
This is supported because the developers also briefly did the opposite and tightened skill-based matchmaking to be even stricter than usual, and the result for that was everyone staying in games more often except the top 10%. Of course, sometimes matchmaking does try too hard to achieve that perfect 50-50 ratio, and that's not always what players want. It doesn't feel good to win and then get thrown into a meat grinder the very next match because of overzealous matchmaking. Blowouts should happen, but only once in a while, at a rate that feels natural. So the end result of this study here is that most people, the bottom 90% specifically, actually prefer skill-based matchmaking, whether they're aware of it or not. And if anything, they probably want it to be stricter so fewer people who are much better than them are able to slip through the cracks and get into their game. It feels like all of this should have been common sense, but a lot of people took off with the skill-based matchmaking is bad narrative, probably due in no small part from manipulative content creators who get their paychecks from making videos of themselves stomping on lower skill players. Remember a year and a half ago when a player got exposed for trying to infiltrate a terminally ill children's hospital to force the kids to play Call of Duty so he can get sick clips off them? Oh man, the crazy snipes and killstreaks will get on these dying kids, bro. The cancer is affecting their ability to avoid these headshots. If players are upset about the online experience, they could be upset about something else, but just attributing it to skill-based matchmaking, because that's the system they're aware of and believe is the most obvious issue. Now, personally, as someone who grew up playing video games with dedicated servers with their own highly customized rules, I think going back to that format would help players even more because it always felt amazing to have one specific server with the exact type of rule set that was the most fun for you. They were called your home server for a reason, because that was the server you were most comfortable in and most likely to be found. Think about Battlefield 3 and those 24-7 max ticket Operation Metro servers. Those were pure chaos, total meat grinders where you could barely even play if it was too one-sided but they were always populated because a ton of people found that insanity really fun and that server was their home. They played with the same players over and over and over again, and there was a degree of comfortable familiarity. It's a shame that so many shooters have abandoned custom servers for this heavily railroaded matchmaking format that keeps you on a treadmill of mostly empty experiences that just blur together more often. Now, going back to the study for a moment, the actual immediate result of turning off skill-based matchmaking was a greater occurrence of one-sided blowouts. If you joined a game, either your team was getting completely annihilated or the opposing team was getting completely annihilated. Chances are it would not be close because with matchmaking turned off, there's nothing trying to even the odds. There's nothing examining the performance or skill level of everyone and trying to sort you all in a way that keeps the playing field level. A lot of people enjoy being on the winning side of a blowout, but no one enjoys being on the losing side of it. And this is why more people quit, especially when blowouts happen all the time, almost totally at random. It's already bad enough to lose, but the lack of consistency on top of that makes it feel even worse. Many players do not enjoy the feeling of total randomness in what is supposed to be a mostly even competitive experience. Now this leads me to the topic of odds and predictability. Some people are still dissatisfied with the presence of skill-based matchmaking because despite it allegedly working, they're still experiencing occasional losing streaks that tank their statistics. Why? Why do winning streaks and losing streaks still happen even when skill-based matchmaking is supposedly working. If I matched up with people who are supposedly at my skill level, then shouldn't my wins and losses feel more evenly spread? What's the deal? Well, the answer to this is a pretty basic game theory premise regarding probability. If you continue to play a game, any game, not just video games, for long enough, eventually very strange patterns will emerge. The easiest example of this is simply flipping a coin. As a coin, it's two-sided, so the chances of it landing on either side is roughly around 50%.
but obviously it's not going to perfectly alternate between heads and tails every single time. If you flip a coin a billion times, you're likely to run into very weird, fucked up patterns that you would not have seen if you only flipped it a hundred times. You might get a pattern where it lands on heads a thousand times in a row. This even happens in major league sports. Sometimes a team that's usually average or maybe even mediocre will suddenly have an amazing season despite very little roster changes or changes to their coaching. Or the opposite, a team that's usually pretty good might have a season that's uncharacteristically disastrous. And again, this is assuming that everyone involved is at a similar skill level. If players are not at a similar skill level, you need some type of matchmaking or sorting to even the odds, because otherwise the more skilled players, the top 10%, will be allowed many, many more opportunities to run rampant on the bottom 90. That's the feeling many of them want to chase, and the unfortunate lower skill players will get utterly destroyed by massive 20, 30, 50 game losing streaks and quit. Now, with all that out of the way, some of you might be wondering, well, if it can still go either way regardless, then why is it such a big deal? The answer to that, besides randomness not feeling good in a competitive setting, is loss aversion. This is where the psychological aspect finally kicks in after all that statistical shit. And I do want to reiterate, I am not a psychologist or a student of psychology, I'm just applying concepts I've read about to my own personal experiences here. Many people are averse to loss, meaning they feel more pain from losses than they do pleasure from gains. In other words, losing feels bad more than winning feels good. That's why people who still win more often than lose might still quit a game after several bad days close together. But this still presents another problem. If people are loss averse and hate losing more than they enjoy winning, then why do some people still insist on chasing the win despite all the losses? This leads me to another concept called gambler's fallacy, which is the belief that if an event has occurred less frequently than expected, then it is more frequently to occur again in the future. When playing any sort of game, a lot of people tend to assume that if something that's supposed to happen regularly doesn't happen that often, then there must eventually come a point where its probability explodes and is more or less guaranteed. But that's not really true. Think of the coin toss again. If you do indeed get 99 heads in a row, then you might think, well, surely chances of landing on tails will now explode to even it out. But then you toss the coin and get heads for the 100th time. Because getting 100 heads in a row and getting 99 heads and then one tails are equally likely and have the same probability. Loot boxes also feed into this because everyone assumes the best drop must be around the corner because I've had several bad pulls now. And then they keep pulling until the pity system finally kicks in and tells them to go away. In a competitive setting though, you've probably fallen victim to the gambler's fallacy at one point by telling yourself, I can't go to bed until I win one, only to end up going to bed without a win anyway. That's a trap everyone falls for at some point. You think you're bound to get a win because you haven't had one in several games, so probability has to kick in in your favor soon, right? Well, no, not necessarily. This goes hand in hand with the next talking point, chasing wins after you've already experienced one. It's a completely natural and human thing to want to continue a win streak after you've managed to grab a few consecutive ones. Winning does feel good but winning multiple times in a row feels incredible. And it only gets better as the number goes up. But a lot of players also fall into the trap of very stubbornly chasing the streak because they think they're on a roll. This leads me to another concept that is considered the counterpart to the gambler's fallacy. And this one is called the hot hand fallacy. And it refers to the belief that a person who experiences a successful result in a task is more likely to continue being successful in subsequent attempts. The name refers to basketball, where it's believed that if a player has hot hands, they'll continue to score shot after shot so long as their previous one was successful. This belief may stem from a lack of understanding regarding randomness and chance sequences. But regardless, just as it feels incredible to gain a big streak, it also feels awful to lose it. 
and a person who has their streak ended might go straight back into the gambler's fallacy by assuming they can pick a streak up again if they just keep playing for that session. However, hot hands is not always a total fallacy. On rare occasions, players do reach special conditions that allow them to perform at their most optimal state. There's a concept called flow, which is also called being in the zone or locked in. It refers to the moment where someone is completely immersed in and enjoying the task they're performing, allowing them to succeed at it with incredible consistency for a limited period. It's when your skill level perfectly aligns with the difficulty of the task and you're suddenly able to succeed with seemingly little effort. You're focusing on the task with great intensity, you're doing the right thing and hitting the right moves without even thinking about it like some sort of machine, and it feels like time has slowed down. It's a state that everyone hopes and tries to enter when they're doing something competitive. And finally, even beyond all that stuff about stats and psychological concepts, there's the personality of the individual player. Some people hop onto an online video game despite hating competition because they enjoy winning. They're not there for a fair fight and never were. They just want the high of a win. You might assume that a person who participates in a competition would enjoy the adrenaline of a close match between players who truly are close in skill level, but not everyone has that competitive heart. For them, that's not fun, it's just stressful. They don't want exciting close matches, they want devastating blowouts as often as possible. Some people care about the result more than the process. They care less about enjoying the game than they do winning the game. But at the same time, I can't always blame them, because some of those players simply haven't experienced the thrill of a close match, and having pulled through at the very end thanks to their own skill. In order to appreciate something like that, one must experience it first. And in order to experience it, one has to make a climb that they might not be able or willing to commit to. They have no way of knowing the thrill is worth it before they've felt it. I have friends who are incapable of sticking with fighting games, not only because they think it's complicated, but because they simply cannot handle the more personal, competitive, one-on-one -on -one experience it offers, typically because of bad competitive experiences as kids. They can only stand to play team-based games because even if they perform poorly, they represent only a fraction of the determinant that decides the results, meaning there's less pressure on the individual and more on the team as a whole, so they can still score a victory if their teammates are competent enough. If you lose in a team-based game, it's not my fault, it's our fault, which, frankly, lessens the negative feeling of personal blame and accountability. I guess to sum up my thoughts, I would just say, skill-based matchmaking is generally a good thing, and it's unfortunate that some players join a competition in spite of the competition, and I do wish more people would simply appreciate the process rather than laser focus on the result. Because personally, I cannot enjoy a game competitively if I don't enjoy the game itself. I still have to find enjoyment even when I lose if I want to continue playing for the win. Furthermore, I wish matchmaking itself wasn't the only way to interact with so many shooters. I wish more of them had persistent custom servers, even if it was just a handful of developer-made servers with slight but impactful deviations from typical rule sets. I think that alone would benefit player retention and enjoyment. That's basically all I have to say on the subject of matchmaking, winning, and randomness in online multiplayer games. If you made it this far into the video, I appreciate it. I also ask that you check out my merch store. As of right now, I have two shirt designs, a sliced skull and a tribute to Hironobu Sakaguchi, creator of the Final Fantasy series. I also have a beanie with my logo embroidered on it. Both shirt designs are available in lightweight fabric and heavyweight cotton. I've already received samples of everything for quality checking, and I can confirm they look great in person. If you're interested, visit mildconviction.com or check the store tab of my YouTube channel page. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.